chapter 10, verses, uh, verses 8 to 10. We'll be looking at verses 1 to 10, but we're going to read to start here, verses 8 to 10. And you'll find that in the Pew Bible on page 633 or 634, one of the two. I forgot to write it down on my notes here, so look in, in the 630s. You'll find Hebrews 10 right there. And as we continue in Hebrews today, we're going to see a summary of uh, everything that we've learned in Hebrews up until this point uh, in a way that I'm hoping is going to kind of make it make sense and kind of bring everything together. As I was reading it this past week, I was thinking, you know, uh, I, I could have just skipped through everything over the last uh, couple of chapters right to this section right here and, uh, and probably, uh, probably nailed pretty well everything. Uh, but of course, the discipline of, uh, of Bible exposition is that you let every verse uh, let every verse uh, come through. Uh, but nevertheless, this is kind of summary today, and so we'll see that. We're going to see how it changes by the end today, how it changes how we read the Bible, and then also how this affects how we approach uh, reflecting Christ uh, in this world. And so we're just going to read verses 8 to 10 uh, to a start off today. Previously saying, that is quoting from Psalm 40, Sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. And he takes away the first that he may establish the second. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. It's a word of the Lord for us today, and we're glad. So this is kind of a summary, like I said, of everything that's come to this point. We've got three headings here, and uh, I want to start by just explaining a little bit of what's going on in verses 1 to 4, which we didn't read, but we can kind of deal with quickly. Verses 1 to 4 summarizes for us that everything before Christ came was a sketch of Christ, a shadow of Christ that would point to him. And verses 1 to 4 are talking about the reasons why that system cannot cleanse people, cannot save people. And this would really be a tough pill for the uh, Jewish readers of this book to swallow because at the time, the temple is still standing. The temple still standing. The sacrificial system is still in effect as far as they're concerned. And so it would be a tough pill to swallow that this thing is not working. This can't really cleanse you like Christ can. But he explains the reasons why it can't. First in verse 1 because the system is a shadow of the real, which is Christ himself. And I just want you to know this is the third straight chapter where the idea that the Old Testament is a shadow of what has come now comes up. Third straight chapter that it comes up like that. Whereas where what is earlier shadows what comes later, or whereas uh, what is temporal shadows what is eternal. It's the third straight chapter it's come up. Verses 2 to 3 make the point that it is designed to give a reminder of sins every year. So by definition, it can't cleanse the conscience. And God doesn't just tell us about our sinfulness so that he can drag us through the mud, but he does it so that we will learn what's wrong with us and why it is that we need to be saved, how it is that we need to be saved. Indeed, that was the purpose. And so in verse 4 there, he makes a point about the participants in the sacrificial system, in particular the animals themselves. It is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats can take away sins. And we'll explain a little bit later on why that's the case, that animals cannot atone for man's sin. But I just want to give a couple of points here about the shadowiness of the Old Covenant. Uh, Calvin points out, and I thought this was really interesting, I'd never known this before. <clears throat> Calvin points out in his commentary that in ancient Greek art, there was a practice that was known as skiographia, and it's still practiced today, but I'm sure it probably uses a different, uh, different word than that. It's the, it's the practice of sketching what it is that you plan on painting before you paint it. So you draw the outlines and then you paint it. They did this at, a, uh, at Northwest uh, Christian School last year whenever they were painting the logo in the gym. The art teacher uh, sketched it you know, with marker or whatever it was, and the kids came in and they painted. That was apparently in the ancient uh, world called skiographia, where you sketch the shape of what is going to be drawn before you do it. Well, the word for shadow there in verse 1 is the word in Greek, skion, and it means, it, it, it means that what came before Christ is apparently the sketch of him. 
It's the drawing of him before he actually comes and fills everything in and makes clear the point and the purpose. It makes the point that the purpose of the law was never to save, but simply to sketch what was to come later. And I think that this, this implies, at the very least, that the old system could have parallels to Christ in the gospel, but also have contrast to it. Parallels meaning that it uses blood to take away sins, but contrast, it doesn't remove sins fully, and it gives a reminder of sins every year, and like I said, animals can't actually atone for sins. Why is there some contrast but some parallels? Because it's merely a sketch. It's not the real thing, it's not the full thing, but it is merely a sketch of what would come later. In fact, the word shadow there in verse 1, using the word shadow, and that is a good translation because that's kind of what one of those art sketches would be. It's a shadow. It's very interesting if you think about it. What is a shadow if it's not the shape of the thing itself cast elsewhere by standing in the way of light? That's what a shadow is. It's the actual thing, the shape of it, being, being cast elsewhere in the place of light. And the point is this. That is what the law in the Old Testament is. The shape of Christ himself cast into a fallen world before he entered into it. That's the idea here. The law, the Old Testament, the entirety of it was the shape of Christ before he entered into it. Not only is that the point that's made here, <clears throat> but it's also made in Colossians 2, verses 16 and 17. This is Paul writing to the church in Colossae. He says, Let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths. Paul is saying, Let nobody pronounce any kind of judgment or any kind of criticism on you Christians because you're not keeping all these different elements of the law. Don't let them, don't, don't let them attack your conscience for this. Let them talk, but don't let it take away your confidence in Christ. Why? <clears throat> because these things are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. You know what the word is in Greek for substance? It's pretty interesting. Soma which is literally body. And forgive me for all the Greek today. I just, think it's, I just think it's fascinating and interesting. And I'm sure that you are just riveted to hear me, to hear me translate all these uh, Greek ideas. But these are a shadow of the things to come, but the body is Christ. Literally, he is saying that the law, the entirety of the system was the body of Christ shadowed before he came into the world. This gives us insight into why Jesus said he came not to abolish the law, but to what? Fulfill it. Matthew 5, 17. Because he wouldn't erase the pencil sketch, would he? He intends to fill it in. And he can't remove the shadow. He is the shadow. But he just has to enter into the place where the shadow was cast, and that is exactly what he came to do. So point is this. Everything before was a tracing of him, his shadow on his way to coming into the world to work actual redemption. The animals of the sacrifice, the tabernacle itself, the priesthood, I would dare say Israel itself, all types of Christ. That's why nothing there, nothing there can make those who approach perfect, it says in verse 1. Can't make perfect those who approach um, through the system. Guilt is always going to come back. It's always going to be inevitable because it is by nature preparatory for the one who actually can save, the one who actually can deliver. And that leads us to the second uh, heading here. So the first one, everything before was a sketch. The second one, <coughs> excuse me, in verses 5 to 7, when Christ comes into the world, the drawing is complete. So in verses 5 to 7 there, he quotes Psalm 40, verses 6 to 8. This is interesting it was uh, David writing this, inspired by the Holy Spirit, looking at his own situation and writing his own prayers, but the Holy Spirit was inspiring this. And it says that Christ said this when he came into the world. Verse 5, when he came into the world, he said, and then it goes through these uh, verses from Psalm 40. It's very interesting. This is Christ's own mission in coming into the world. What did he say? That God hasn't delighted in sacrifice? but he's prepared a body for me. 
So he says in verse 7, I've come to do your will as it is written of me in the book. Now, by the way, this is from the Septuagint version of the Old Testament, which is the Greek Old Testament. The Bible that you have is translated from the Hebrew Old Testament. That's why if you were to read Psalm 40, you would see that it doesn't say body. It says ears. Ears you've prepared for me. But that's kind of a synecdoche, meaning that it represents the entirety of the body. The Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint, has the word body in it. The implication seems to be that this Messiah figure taking a body and doing God's will is going to somehow replace the sacrificial system. It's going to replace it. How is that the case? Well, if you were to look in the original Psalm, in Psalm 40, <clears throat> in verse 12, actually right after that quotation that's used here in Hebrews 10, in verse 12 of that Psalm, David says, my sins have overtaken me. And some commentators look at that and say, well, then it's inappropriate for the writer of Hebrews here to say that that's Christ talking because Christ didn't have any, have any sins. Excuse me. So can this even apply to Christ? But again, we have to remember the entirety of the Old Testament, the whole of it, is a sketch of him. In fact, as the word eternally, nothing was ever spoken in God's word but by him. It was actually Christ speaking through David. As David wrote down out of his own experience, his own prayers, he was led by the Holy Spirit, who is the Spirit of Christ himself. What else does it mean when it says in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God? Anything God ever spoke, he spoke by his Son. Anything David wrote that ended up being inspired by the Spirit as it was canonized in the Scriptures was actually Christ himself. And so when Christ says through David that, quote, his sins overtook him, it was not his own sins, but it was the sins of his people that he was identifying with. That's why Paul can write in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for our sake he made him who knew no sin to be what? Sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So the idea here is, again, it's not that the Messiah actually has sin. If he did, he, he couldn't save us. He wouldn't be the Messiah. But the idea here is that the Messiah saves us by actually taking our sins onto himself, replacing us on the seat of God's judgment. That's why God told David in 2 Samuel 7, speaking to him about a son that he would have, who would have an eternal, everlasting kingdom. He says, when he sins, I will discipline him with the stripes of the Son of Man. And we look at that and we're like, so the Messiah is going to sin? But if you connect it with Isaiah 53, where it says that by his stripes we are healed, and in that same chapter it talks about how he takes the sins of the people, then it makes sense what it's talking about. It's not that he's going to sin himself, it's that he is going to become sin on our behalf. So the point is this, Christ, as he's come into the world, completes the drawing, the picture is perfect, and now we know what it is that we need to know about God, the world, how we connect with him, who we really are, all of these things. Christ is the system, Christ is God who revealed the system, Christ is the priest atoning, and Christ is even the sin itself that needs atoned for because he takes it on himself. We might wonder why it is in verse 7 there, it says in the volume of the book it is written of me. What book is it talking about? I think it's talking about the Old Testament itself. Whispering Christ's name, begging for a resolution. Now those of you who um, grew up in a time where TV wasn't uh, driven by uh, streaming services where you can just binge watch every show back to back to back, you remember at the end of the show sometimes that would come on once a week, it would say, to be continued. It was a story that was begging for a resolution and then you would have to sit there and wait for an entire week on that, on that story to be resolved. And if you watch soap operas, the story's never resolved. Not that I know anything about soap operas. He tried to convince the people. 
But the Old Testament was a story that is incomplete, begging for a resolution. And so when it says here in the volume of the book, it is written of me to do your will, O God, it's, it's, saying, that, it's saying that this is begging to be resolved, and it's got to be resolved by somebody who's going to perfectly embody everything in himself. The sketch says, what I'm trying to say is this, the sketch says if God doesn't do something to address man's alienation from God and change man from the inside out, man is going to be lost. Christ is indeed God doing something. He is God drawing near to man to bring him to himself, promising to do the work necessary to change him from the inside out. Indeed, he not only does something, but Christ does everything to work our redemption on, on our behalf. That's why the book of Revelation refers to him as the Alpha and the Omega. It's not just that he's the end, so Alpha's first letter of the Greek alphabet, Omega is the last letter, so it's the A to Z. It's not just that he's the end. He's the beginning. Everything's been all about him every step of the way. Everything's been pointing to him. Everything's been preparing for him. And then he who is the beginning comes in at the end to resolve the story so that we will trust in him, believe in him, and be happy in him who is happy as well. And so <clears throat> first heading here was, uh, was talking about how everything before was a sketch. Second one is that when Christ comes, the drawing is complete. Third heading here is how it truly cleanses us. So in verses 8 to uh, 10, it makes this point. That Christ coming and doing the will of God, verse 9, does away with the first in order to establish the second. So again, the old system with its continual reminders of sin and its inability to penetrate the heart is now washed away in place of the fullness of Christ. And you might say, well, I thought, I thought you said that it was a, a drawing that was turned into a painting. How is it that it washes away the drawing. It's because when the paint gets put onto the canvas, you can't see the drawing anymore. All you can see is the paint. That's the idea here. He's doing away with it being a mere drawing, and he is now adding color and finishing it. And by this will, it says in verse 10, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ once for all. And the fact that it says once for all suggests to me that this isn't just referring to the process of sanctification where we're, we're made more to look more Christ-like as the days go by, but it's referring to the entirety of our salvation. We're set apart for Christ when we come to faith. We're being made to look more and more like Christ as the days go by, and in the end, it's going to be made a complete work. This is talking about the entirety. The whole thing is finished in Christ. It's complete, it's done. That's why, again, Romans 8, you hear me say it all the time, says that those whom he justified, he also glorified. It's finished. It's already done. It's already complete. If you trust in Christ now, you are going to trust in Christ for the rest of your life. And then you're going to trust in him for all of eternity, even when you don't have to believe in him anymore because you live in his presence. If you are in Christ, you stay in Christ because it's once for all. There's no reminder of sins in Christ, just like, like the old system was. Only a perfect mediator who intercedes on our behalf. I think the idea is this. I'm still a sinner. This doesn't need to be explained. It's obvious. But Christ has a perfection that is more powerful than my sinfulness. Whereas sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. And so therefore, if I try to come to God by faith in Christ, I get there. Not because I'm so smart and so attractive, but I get there because Christ's body has made a way for somebody like me to get to God. That is how he cleanses us. It's, it's kind of like, you know, you see these, uh, you hear these stories sometimes of, uh, of people uh, stealing 
identification from others who have like a high security clearance in the mili in the uh, government or something like that, or you see this on movies and TV shows, and so they're able to get to a place where they're not really supposed to be able to get to because they use somebody else's identification to get there. Again, whether it's real life or whether it's a movie or show or something like that, it's not unlike what happens in the gospel. We actually are able to get to God who is perfect, who is sinless, who is glorious, even though we really have no business going into God's presence because he gives us Christ's own righteousness. And it's true; it truly becomes ours, seen in the fact that as we journey with Christ, we're becoming more and more like him. So that when Christ returns or whether, whether he comes first or we go to him, he's actually going to recognize us. We're actually going to recognize him because it was more than than merely him giving us an identity that's himself, but it's actually shaping us and molding us as we journey with him. That's why in verse 20, uh, a little bit later in the chapter, it talks about, so it talked about how the body that he had in verse 5, the body you've prepared for me, later on in verses 19 and 20, therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. That is to say, who is Christ? He is the actual veil that separates us from the holiest of holy places. And because he has come and done this work for us, we can then enter into the holy place because he has opened the veil on our behalf. That's why when he, when he died, you remember what happened? The veil to the Holy of Holies opened up. It tore down the middle because it truly did tear. Now the people who long for God can get to him. So the point was this. The point of the earlier reminders was to tell us that we need atoned for, we need cleansed, we need perfected. Animals can't do it. Why? I said I was going to return to this later. Why can't animals atone for our sins? Because animals can't sin. That might be surprising to you, but animals actually don't sin. Say, so, well, they seem to do a lot of destruction sometimes, but they're not sinning. They're instinctive. I heard R.C. Sproul say one time that he was going to take um, John Calvin to task in heaven one day for Calvin saying that, uh, oh, what is it? I should have thought about this before I got up here. Um, Try to make sure I had all the details. Calvin was talking about how how um, how children are are as uh, children are as sinful as rats or something like that. And Sproul said he's going to uh, take Calvin a task by saying, "I thought that was enormously insulting to the rats <laughs> because rats don't sin; they're instinctive. They don't they don't sin. People sin. People go against God's will." Rats only do what they, what they know to do based on their instincts. People are different than this. Animals cannot atone for sins because animals can't sin. But on the other hand, a mere man couldn't atone for sin either because all that a man is, is a sinner. And so what's going to have to happen? God's going to have to do it. And that is why Christ had to be both God and man, because he had to be man with our nature and he had, to be, he had to be God with his holiness and his perfection. And indeed, in Christ, God redeems us and it is finished. Once you understand and once you see the glory, the glory of this gospel, the, the glory of, the, of this, this drama of redemption that God is working in his creation, that that. It's the plan and the purpose from eternity that he then realizes in his son. It's like there's no going back to any other redemptive narrative that you believed in before. There's also no Christianity other than a Christianity that has Christ at the very center of all things. And so that kind of leads me into some, some kind of practical things I want to say here. <clears throat> the idea that, the, that what happened before the Old Testament was a sketch the shadow of Christ as God's glorious light shone on him into a fallen world before he actually entered into the fallen world. That has relevance for two points. Both of these are practical, I think, but the second one 
is going to be a little bit more maybe theoretical sounding. The first one's going to be more theoretical sounding. The second one's going to be like directly practical. So just bear with me here. But the relevance of what we're talking about here, where everything was focused on Christ and moving towards him, first relevance is this. It has relevance to your Bible reading. That is to say that if we want to read the Bible as Christians, we have to start from Christ because he is the A to Z. He, he is what this is all about. We have to begin our understanding of Scripture with Jesus himself. Most American evangelicals read their Bibles from the perspective of the Old Testament. And the thing is, <clears throat> I, uh, I don't think that it's wrong to start with the Old Testament, but I do think that when we get to the New, if it tells us the meaning of the Old Testament, we then should be letting that determine how we understand what we're reading from the Old Testament. So it's like this constant kind of spiral going back and forth. But the vast majority starts from the Old Testament and concludes with one of two errors, which in my opinion won't give Christ his due. And with what I'm about to say, I'm going to put myself on an island here. Um, it's, it's going to be challenging, and I, I don't want to be disrespectful. I'll just say this. I'm willing to put myself on an island because I think that that island already has some giants on it. Augustine, Irenaeus, I would dare say the Apostle Paul himself, Christ himself. But one error that comes from not starting with Christ in our reading of Scripture is what I would call the dispensational error. And that suggests that the chosen people of God are allowed to not believe in Christ. This is an Israel-centric way of reading Scripture. And the thought, hear me out before you tune me out, the thought here is that Jews... And all those who are descended from Judaism, which, by the way, includes me, I've got, I, I'm, I'm one-eighth Jewish, actually. Um, my mom's paternal grandmother was Jewish. That all of those who are descended from Judaism, just by nature of bloodline, are God's people, regardless of what they believe. But this neglects that the New Testament says clearly that not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. Romans 9, 6. In fact, Paul says a true Jew is one whose religion is where? In the heart. It's in the heart. And so he says, therefore, a Gentile could be closer to God actually than a Jewish person could because God is looking at the heart. The issue is the heart. So who are the people of God? Here's the answer. Christ and all of those Jew and Gentile who trust in him, they're the people of God. It's not based on bloodline, it's based on faith. John opened his gospel by saying, those who believed in Christ, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but born of what? God. The issue is if they trust in Christ or not. But if you read the New Testament as a parenthesis to God's purposes, frankly, as Darby and Schofield both said to do, you don't see Christ as the plan and purpose, and so you'll miss this. And what I'm trying to say here, what I'm trying to show you from Hebrews itself, is that Christ is the purpose. He is the plan. It's all about him, and everything before was a sketch to prepare the way for him so that the people of God, the Jewish people, the Gentiles, whoever it is, would see and have access to all of God's best in his son. But there's another error. And I think that the vast majority, again, like I said, of American evangelicals have been taken in with this first error, but a lot of others have been taken in with a second error, and I will call this the covenantal error. And this error says that not all covenant members have to believe in him. 
And there is first a pedo-baptist version of this. This is the baby, baptist, baby baptism version of this. It says, and it's, this is Methodists, Presbyterians, Anglicans, others, that since New Testament baptism replaces Old Testament circumcision, therefore we baptize babies who don't believe, presuming that eventually they will. There's also a credo-baptist version of this, uh, a believer's baptism version of this that doesn't believe in the infant baptism thing, but it says that since the law is a witness for forever, the reason why we become Christians is to keep the law, usually with an emphasis on the Sabbath. So the new covenant really isn't about faith, but it's about the law. And I think that both of those ways of thinking are error. Both are reading the New Testament through the lens of the old and, again, not allowing what the New Testament says about the purpose of the old to then, to then shape how we understand the relationship of them. Israel, as a covenant community, was a type of the believing church. As a type, it's not a perfect parallel. So infant baptism doesn't follow from circumcision because it's not the same thing. That's why when you read the New Testament... Do you know how many infant baptisms there are? Zero. There's not a single one. Because baptism is for those who trust in Christ and those who trust in Christ alone. Are you seeing a theme here? This is about whether you trust in him and believe in him or not. And furthermore, about the law, the law can only reveal sin and bring people to Christ so that they will trust in him and receive the Holy Spirit and walk in him, fulfilling the law's requirement. They fulfill the law's requirement, Romans 8.3 says, by walking in the Spirit, not by keeping the law. Now, everywhere that I go, I'm an anti-something because of what I just said. I'm either an antinomian, if I'm around my Reformed Baptist and Reformed Presbyterian friends, I went to a Presbyterian seminary. I'm either an antinomian, which means anti-law, because they think that the law is meant to curtail sin. I say, I don't think so. I think the law only reveals sin, and once we trust in Christ, we receive the Holy Spirit to then walk by faith in him, and that changes us. So they say, so you think that sin is okay? I say, no, I think regeneration changes us. And I think that you're minimizing that. But if I go around my dispensational friends, and I have a lot, I'm considered to be an anti-Semite because I must hate the Jewish people even though I'm part Jew myself. Oh, you say that they're not chosen now, so do you think that they just shouldn't exist as a nation? I say, that is not what I said at all. What I said was, they need Christ. And they're going to go to hell if they don't get him. Just like every single person on earth is going to go to hell if they don't have Jesus. I just think that folks sometimes won't think. But most importantly, regardless of my diagnosis of it, there's a tendency to just not give Christ his due. To not let him be center. To not let him be the both the sketch in the old and the final drawing in the new. There's a quote from uh, John Trapp. This was, I, I saw this in the uh, Church History Study Bible. I just thought it was beautiful. Let me just read it to you real fast here, if I can find it in all my pictures. Christ is the author, object, matter, and mark of both the Old and the New Testaments. Therefore, if we will profit thereby, we must have the eyes of our minds turned toward Christ, as the faces of the cherubim were turned towards the mercy seat. The idea here being that just like the cherubim, there's a lot that they could be looking out after, and yet they can't stop looking at God. So if we would profit from the scriptures, the only way that it's going to make sense to us, the only way that we're going to really be filled with the Spirit of God to reflect him well, is if our eyes are turned toward Christ. Let me just say this. We don't take a stance in our statement of faith on the things that I just was talking about a few minutes ago. Your, your view of the law in the, uh, the life of the Christian, your view of the, um, how the Bible fits together in the, the place of Israel. We don't take a stance on this because Christians can agree to disagree. 
but it's not the real faith if Christ if Christ isn't the alpha and the omega. If he's not just the end, but he's also the beginning as well. That's what I'm jealous for. Everything before was a shadow. Why would we start with the shadows when the fullness is in front of us now? We start with the fullness, and then we see how the pieces contribute to the bigger picture, Christ himself. That just makes sense to me. And when I was in seminary with my Presbyterian friends, treated like the Baptist redheaded stepchild that I was, getting weird looks and getting, getting side eyes like that sometimes, I'm like, that's fine. I'll pray for you to see Christ. Pray for me to see Christ too, that we wouldn't miss anything. Okay, so that's more theoretical, but I do think it's practical. Secondly here, this one's quick. This is very, very quick. I just got a couple lines left in my notes here. This is very much more directly practical. So the relevance of what we're talking about here has had, it's got relevance to your Bible reading. It's also got relevance here, secondly, to your mission in life. What do you exist for now? Why hasn't Christ taken you into glory yet? Why hasn't he returned yet? Because your job is to be a living sketch of Christ now. You are not, I'm just going to save you the suspense. You're not going to perfectly image Jesus in this life. But the law also didn't perfectly image Jesus in this life. It was a sketch. It doesn't have direct parallels in every sense. That wasn't the point of the law, to be a perfect sketch of him. The point of it was to prepare for him. And it's not the point of your having the same spirit that Christ had and has for you to be a perfect sketch of him as well. The law was his shadow until he came, and now I'm telling you that you are his shadow until he comes again. He takes that which was seen in an institution in the old, and he puts it into people's hearts in the new. Your job is to be a sketch of him in the present, even now. God is pleased to sum up all things in Christ, which includes your reflecting him in this life, even imperfectly. One of my favorite chapters in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians 3, where Paul contrasts the law as a ministry of death with the gospel as a ministry of life. He says, all that did in the past was kill. What this one does is actually give glory and give life. But at the end of the chapter... You know what he says, and you know these verses probably well. At the end of 2 Corinthians 3, what does he say? The Lord is the Spirit. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. What's the whole purpose? What's the whole goal? That we would look like Christ. That we would have Christ in us, sketching him shadowing him. Your goal in life, your mission in life is to reflect him. It's not to be a good American, a good person, a continuation of your family tree. It's not to get respect from other people. It's not to do a good job with what you have in stewardship first. I mean, that's a secondary thing. These things are important. But before anything else, your mission in life is to be a shadow of Christ until he returns. My question is, what is God drawing with you? It's something. Let it be Christ. If so, you will keep it for forever. Let's pray. So our Father and our God, today, um, regardless of how we read or how we understand how the Bible fits together, my prayer first and foremost is that we would see Christ in his glory with the eyes of our hearts, that we would enjoy him, 
that he would be able to have all that is his. Be glorified in us, we pray, O Lord. And I pray that we would be driven, not just by love for others, but by love for God before anything else. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Let us, O Lord, by your Spirit do that, which then will open up the way for us to reflect you to those around us. May we walk in love every step of the way. I pray that if there's anybody here who doesn't know eternal life in Christ, show them, O Lord. Open the eyes of their hearts to see the glory of God in the face of Jesus. May they bring their sins to him. May they understand that he went to the cross on their behalf, that he rose to make them new as well. And move in our hearts, O Lord, as you see that we need. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. So if you have, a, um, if you have your, the blue folder there in front of you, not the hymnal, the big black book, but the blue folder there in front of you, it says praise and worship on the front.